Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for this beautiful Sabbath and this beautiful family. It's been so long since I've seen you two. <laughs> Praise God. Is it okay if I pray with you one more time? Yeah. Lord God, Lord God, I want to use yet one more little opportunity to ask and to call out your name and to grab hold of your, your cloak and grab hold of you, Father, take me in your hands and I, I pray that you would take this whole entire place in your hands so that the enemy can't worm his way in, Father. Lord God, I pray that you would clear our minds and our thoughts. Lord God, speak to us. Speak to our precise, specific situations that we're going through right now. All of us here are going through so many things. You know every little detail. Father, allow us, help us to learn to trust you and to hand all these things over to you so that you can take over. Father, that's my prayer today, that you will take over our lives and take over this service. Father, that you will speak to us right now. We need your word right now, Father. I pray. And I thank you because you're going to speak to us. And I thank you because you're going to manifest yourself right now in this place. Thank you, Lord. As always, in the name of Jesus, we turn it all over to you. Amen. Amen. Testing, testing, all right. Here we go. Good to see you guys. I, uh, the pastor asked me if I could, since I'm here with my brother visiting for this week and next, uh, if one of us could have a word and share a little bit of a word with you guys. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I would love to. You guys are my family. It's good to see all of you. So I, uh, this past few weeks, uh, this last week, just this week actually, I was in Georgia. And as the pastor mentioned, um, they, God he has opened the door for me to, to make my way to Georgia and, and to help out a, in a church over there. So that's where I'm going to be. And uh, the Lord God has uh, touched those people to be kind enough to allow me into their, the same way you guys allowed me into your, into your hearts, they've allowed me into their, into their church. And this whole week I've been explaining and, and telling the story of Bonita to them over there. And I've been telling them all about you guys. I know they want to meet you guys now. They, they, they want to tune in on YouTube, and, and they will. And I know they're going to meet you in person. I don't know when, but if not here, then in heaven they're going to meet you guys. Amen. And they're going to, they're going to want to hear all about it. So, but no, I've been telling them a lot about my, uh, they've been asking, where's Tell me about your call to ministry. Tell me about why you feel, if you understand that God has called you, tell us about that. What has he done in your life? And I told him, I, I, I've been looking back, and I've, I've always mentioned this to you, especially to the young people, but to all of you, especially those of you who have been around longer than I have, you have even more to look back on. Always look back at how God has led. Don't look back at the negative things. That's what a lot of times when we look back, we start to look at the negative things. Man, I should have did this, should have did that. No, look at how God has led. Look at the things he's done. Sometimes you might say, well, Lord, I look back and all I see is tragedy. All I see is negative. Look at it this way. That's just the enemy. All the times that the enemies attacked you, tried to destroy you, and that he failed. Because you're here now. You're alive. And God is now trying to continue his story, his plan in your life. Okay? Amen. Look back at your life and notice that's what I've been doing a lot lately. And I've realized that I think now more than ever is the best time to take seriously his word. And that's, that's the main message I want you, I want you all to take away from today. It's time to start taking seriously his word. Okay. What does the word say? Okay. First of all, what is the word? What is this? Okay, because God isn't here physically. Do you, do you see him? I don't see him. I have to close my eyes and by faith believe that he is and that he's actually right here with me. But I can't see him. Because God knew that this would happen. He knew sin was going to separate us from him. He left me this. What is this? 
This is an entire history of how God has worked in the past. This tells you everything he expects of his followers. It's the map, the blueprint to get home. He loves you so much that he left you, even though he can't be visibly with you. He's left you his precise words for your life. If only you take time every morning and go over it, you'll see that we're going to make it. We're going to make it through. The enemy's already been beaten. Amen? Amen. Amen. You all believe that? Amen. A few of you do. <laughs> she does. I believe it, and I, I've been realizing, like I'm saying, as I've been going over the journey, and I thank God for the journey that he's led us through. I've been realizing, Lord, I need now more than ever to take seriously your word and every little thing that it brings forward. I was just sharing this with the, with the Spanish group. The word provides so many things that I need to start taking seriously. Okay? First of all, he says he's coming soon. And he tells me, I can actually know, not the day or the hour. I need to lay hold of by faith and believe he's coming soon. But it says he's coming soon. And it says I can know when he's coming closer and closer and closer. Go to 1 Thessalonians. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians. Okay? Because the other day I was talking with a uh, very educated doctor, a scholar, fellow who's read the Bible more times than you can count. And he was telling me that uh, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he was telling me that Wesley, it's not right to point out some great event or some a hurricane or an earthquake or a terrorist attack or when something great happens in the world, some terrible thing, to point at that and say, see, Jesus is coming. I said, why? Wow. He's like, yeah, that's not right. I'm like, man, I, I do that a lot. He said, that's not right. Man. Because what you're doing is you're, you're alarming people and you're getting people to follow Christ and maybe to make a decision, but out of fear, you see. And I was like, man, that's true. So it's not right to point at world events and say, see, Jesus is coming soon. And I almost fell for that. And I realized the Bible don't say that. What is 1 Thessalonians 5? Well, we'll just start there at verse 1. Of the times and of the seasons, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Are we there, verse 1? Amen. amen. If you're there, say amen. 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 Of the seasons and the times, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. And in other words, you don't know when it's coming. And you don't know when a thief is going to show up. If you did, his job would uh, be ruined. So you don't know when he's coming. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail or as labor pains, some versions may say, upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, you're not in darkness that that day shall overtake you like a thief. So what's he saying? You can know when the day is coming soon. You're not in darkness like the people who don't know and get surprised by the thief. Verse 6, therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and what? Be sober. When someone's not sober, what are they? Drunk. They're drunk. They're not aware. He's saying be aware. Okay? It mentions here, why do I say that that fellow was wrong in, in what he was saying? Pointing out world events to say, see, Jesus is coming. He's coming soon. It, it makes a comparison as travail upon a woman with child, as labor pains on a pregnant woman. Has anyone here ever been pregnant? What is it? Once, my sister here raised her hand. When you're, when you're going through that, you feel it, oh, a crazy, almost feels like you're going to die, pain, right? Just once, and then it's over, right? No. What do you mean, no? Doesn't it hurt? Hours. Hours. Is it just one sharp pain and then done? It gets worse. It gets worse. 
<laughs> there are many, what do they call them? Contractions. Yes. Those contractions hurt. They start, but as time goes on, what happens? They get worse and they get what? More frequent, frequent more often. Mm -hmm. This is the, this is what the Bible, not West, this is what the Bible is telling us. Okay, because people, and, and this is what the, the fellow told me, he's like, West, you can't, there's always been earthquakes, there's always been wars and rumors of wars. So you can't point stuff out like that and say, see, Jesus coming, that's always existed. People will decide for Christ, when they see that he doesn't come, they'll walk away. I say, well, brother, here it says, yes, there's always been earthquakes and rumors and, and wars and all this. But it's not saying when you see those things. No, it's saying when you see those things happening closer and closer together. The closer they come together, the closer we are coming to what? The day of the Lord. When you turn on the news today, okay, and all this is, I'm, I'm trying to make the point that I've been realizing I need to start taking the Bible seriously. The Bible says, when you see the birth pains getting closer and closer, you can know the day is getting closer and closer. And today, when I turn on the news, I mean, it's back to back. There's no pause in between. Boom, 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 just one after the other. So I can know, hey, I need to start taking the word seriously. I need to start fortifying myself, putting on the armor, because it's coming. Something's coming. What's coming? Jesus. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming soon, but right before he comes, it's going to come a time of trouble. Mm -hmm. None of this, the Bible says, should, you should not be asleep. Okay, in other words, that, that fellow was just making excuses to not be, like it says, watch, watchful and sober. He's making excuses to not be sober, to not be watchful. I need to start taking the Bible more seriously. The Bible tells me, watch. Jesus said, hey, watch, pray. Be aware. I'm coming soon. I'm trying to take everyone home and put a stop to all the pain. I need you all to be aware and awake because I'm coming soon. There's a work that I want to do in you all. I don't just want to come and take you with me. I want to take as many more as possible. And I want to use you all to do it. But I need you to be aware. I need you to be sober. You need to be taking the Bible serious. That's what I've been realizing. The Bible talks about all types of all types of things. It talks about the commandments. Oh boy, here he goes with the commandments. I need to start taking seriously what the word says about the commandments. Okay? What's the Bible say? Jesus, Jesus said, if you love me, what? A Pharisee didn't say that. Martin Luther didn't say that. Ellen White didn't say that. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. People will know okay, who you follow when they see that you love one another. When I analyze the Ten Commandments, love for God, love for, your, love for your neighbor. This is all love right here. If you look at this and don't see God's love, you've been, how do I say, I don't know, you've been indoctrinated with something else that's not the truth. Because this is God's love. This literally teaches you how to treat. I think in Romans it says that when you love your fellow man, you fulfill the law. You are doing the law when you love your neighbor. That's in the Bible. So I need to start taking seriously what the Bible says about his law. I need to start taking seriously what the Bible says about the word and how important it is. What's the Bible say? What's the psalmist say? There's a verse that you guys have memorized, uh, Psalm 119, 105. She, she's got it. It's Spanish, though. I'll read it in English. <laughs> there you go. Psalm 119. If this one's not highlighted in your Bible by now, it should be. Psalm 119, 105. What's it say? What is the word? Hey, I, I just asked, what is this that God left us? Let's see what, what someone who has a lot of experience, depending on God's word, what does he say about the word? Psalm 119, verse 105. If you're there, let me hear you say amen. 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 Thy word is what? A lamp to my feet. A light unto my path. 
if I turn out all these lights and cover the windows, it gets dark. And if I just take off running towards the door, I'm probably not going to make it to the door. Because I'm going to trip over one of you. I'm going to trip over this wooden thing here in front of me. A light shines so that I can step over and see where to go. The psalmist, man, how much trouble did, did the psalmist David go through? He had men chasing him to kill him. He had to depend completely on the Lord, and you couldn't, he couldn't see the Lord. He could only depend on what he had put away from the word in here. And in the past experiences of how God led him, he would look back on and say, ah, if God led me through all this, he'll surely lead me through the rest. And that's how he got through it. That's how you and I have to get through it. Amen. Okay? It's time, I've been realizing, to take seriously the word of God. It's a lamp to your feet. It's time to start taking seriously what the Bible says about judgment. Judgment. Oh, that's a terrible word. Don't judge me, right? We say. But judgment, is judgment something bad? It's bad if you're guilty. All of you all are guilty. We're all guilty. The Bible says all have sinned and come short. So then judgment's a bad thing. Is it? If I accept the blood of who? Jesus. Jesus died. Leviticus in the sanctuary says that the life is in the blood. So if the blood of Jesus covers me, the life of Jesus, the record of Jesus, which was spotless, is now over me. And I'm spotless. If I accept it and believe it, it's mine, is what Jesus is trying to say. Romans 2, talking about judgment. Why do I need to even worry and care about that? That's an ugly word. Romans 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 6. Talking about God will render to every man according to his deeds. To them, verse 7, who by patience, this is Romans chapter 2, verse 7. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. Verse 8, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. In other words, hey, Wes, but hold up. That sounds like salvation by works. It's telling you he who does all this good stuff will, God will give him according to his deeds. That's works. Brothers and sisters, when I have accepted the salvation of Christ, my actions will reflect it. He who does good deeds, why? Because he's accepted the salvation of Christ. He who does all these, you know, perverse things and evil and continuance and evil, it's because he has rejected Christ. In other words, the character who you, the, that you reflect is what matters. That's what this is all about. Either you reflect Christ's character, you've been saved, and you reflect, you keep, like he said, you keep my commandments, or you reflect the other character. This right here, you want to know what God is like? Right here. Jesus Christ, you want to know what he was like? He only lived for his father and for who? For himself. No. For everyone else. He never lived for himself, never did anything for himself. Amen. Amen. I need to take seriously what the Bible is telling me about judgment. Because I want to reflect the character of Christ. And only he who reflects the character of Christ is going to make it through and go home with Christ. Amen? I need to start taking it seriously. I need to start taking seriously what the Bible says about my life, my own very own existence. What's the Bible say? There's a verse that comes to my mind of how the Christian's life, the meaning of life, the purpose of a Christian. Go to Revelation. One of, probably one of the more famous chapters in Revelation, chapter 12. Revelation 12, verse 10. Sorry, verse 11. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Okay. And they, talking about you and I, 
and those who suffer for Christ, those who get locked up and maybe even killed because they stand true to God, they overcame who? They overcame Satan by what? They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives, what? Unto death. What does that mean? The Bible talking about how I should live my life and consider my own life. What does it say? The only people who are going to overcome and go home with Jesus loved not their lives unto death. What does that mean? If you could reword that, that's Old English, King James English. What does that mean? Love not their lives unto death. How would you reword that? What does that mean? In Spanish, I like how it says in Spanish, means they menospreciar. How do you say that? They, they didn't consider it important. Their own life, they didn't even consider it important unto death. In other words, they lived like Christ for God and for other people. They didn't live for themselves. God comes first. What he asks of me comes first. Why? How could, when I read that, I'm like, Lord, how am I ever going to get to that point that I would actually love not my life to death, that I would die? How is that possible? How in the world can I get to not valuing my own life and even losing it if I have to for Christ? When I take seriously and I fill my mind with the promises from the Word, what does God promise me? The whole reason I get up in the morning and don't kill myself, what does He promise me? Because people around the world who don't know Christ, they give up, they, they take drugs, they overdose, they take their own lives because they don't know this. What does the Bible promise me? What does God promise those who believe in Christ? Eternal life with Him. And not just eternal life with Him, but eternal life with Him in a brand new, perfect body. If I have that in my mind and every day I go over those promises and early in the morning before I start my day, then when you threaten my life, I'm going to laugh. When you say, hey, you come in and work on Sabbath, or you're not going to get this and this and this, I laugh. Because God gave me life. Amen. He's in charge of my life. And if you kill me, he's going to give me new life. Amen. You can't do that for me. No man can do that for me. Only God. That's why I serve God and no one else. Even if you take my life. Amen. Though that's what that verse is saying. Those are the people who are going to overcome. This is what the Bible says. I realize, man, I need to start devouring the word and digesting it and, and taking it seriously. Amen. I need to start taking it seriously how the Bible says I should glorify God. That's my purpose. That's my duty. The duty of a man. Amen. What's the Bible say in 1 uh, in, uh, Corinthians? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. There's plenty of verses I know you guys can think of about glorifying God. These are just some of the ones that he brought to my mind. 1 Corinthians, what chapter did I say? Six. Six. Chapter 6. Amen. Let's start at verse, let's see, verse 17 onward. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 reads, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit, okay, with the Lord. Free fornication, verse 18. Every sin that a man do, doeth without or outside the body, but he that is outside the body, but he that commits fornication sins against his own body. Then it says, what? Don't you know that your body is what? It's the temple of God. It's the temple of God. This building here is not the temple of God. This here. Is the temple of God. Amen. Okay. Listen here. Don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Why? How can I not be my own? The, the world doesn't understand this. Why? Because you were bought, verse 20, with a price. Therefore, glorify God in what? In your body. In your body. 
See, I, I, get, I'm, I get so into, man, the, the spiritual realm, the spiritual world, this is a spiritual battle, but I forget the body, the Apostle Paul is telling me, your body is a big deal. You glorify God with your body. I'm like, why? How? Because that's the first thing people see when they look at you. Even before they hear you talk, they're looking at your body. You are your body. Glorify God in your body. Okay? If the body is the temple, this, okay, this is a temple. This is a sanctuary. I'm not going to glorify God by just dumping in any old thing in the temple, right? This is the temple that God wants to dwell in, so I'm not going to just pour in any old thing in God's temple to glorify Him. I glorify God. I remember, this is kind of like a, a juvenile way of thinking. This is when I was a lot younger. I still like to think that I'm young, but when I was just understanding and learning the Bible, and I was exercising and doing all this, and I was like, man, I want to be in shape. I want to be a machine. I want people to look at me and say, wow, if that's what Adventists are doing, that's, that's actually what you believe? I want to do that. But then I was like, this is a silly thought, but this is, this is what came to my mind. I said, Lord, what if it's been the persecution time? What if they grab me and lock me up and I have to die for you? All that exercise and all that work and, and watching what I eat and all this, it's kind of wasted. I didn't understand. What's the Bible say? Present yourselves a living what? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Okay. It would, the thing, I, I believe this now more than ever, I understand now, the thing that would glorify God the most is if I eat and watch my diet and, and, and build up my body so that I can die for Christ. So that everyone can see, man, that man did all that. He, he eats, he drinks, he works out, he does all this stuff. Not for himself. To bring glory, to bring attention to his God. Amen. That's crazy. Some of you are looking at me now like I'm crazy. It says glorify God in your body. Your body is what you use to glorify God. I can't sing and do it. I, I was joking with a, a friend. I was like, man, these pastors, they're either super huge or super, you know, toothpicks. We got to glorify God in our body. Whatever we put in through here, through here, through here, has to glorify God. Amen. Everything you do, the Bible says, when you eat and drink, you do it, how can I glorify God with this? I realize, man, I need to start taking seriously what the Bible says about glorifying Him. I need to start taking seriously the mission. Amen. Go to Luke. What's the Bible say about what I am to do, my mission, how I, how, how I treat others? Well, my ultimate example is Jesus. So what, how did Jesus do this? Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. amen. Luke chapter 19, let's go to verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. It's a famous short little verse. For the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is come to seek and to save what? That which was lost. What was lost? He came. His whole duty, his whole purpose was to come, seek out, and save what was lost. What was lost? Mankind. He lived for the Father and for mankind. You and I, he's our example. We are mirrors of Christ to the rest of the world. Oh, we are to live, to honor my God, my Father, and to let him use me to save everyone else. I can't, he can't do that if I don't keep his law, if I don't glorify him with my body. He's literally left me everything I need to do to follow for him to transform my life and turn me into a tool to bring others to him. Because he wants to come and, and put an end to sin and finish all of this. That's what you and I have to want more than anything. Okay? Amen. Amen. Talking about all this, you know, I, I realize, man, God, the Bible is telling me how to, literally training me, training me to be a vessel a tool, a, a, 
a spiritual athlete for the Lord, for his army, for his work. What's the Bible say about training? You know, Paul always mentions, oh, I strive for the mastery. And someone who strives, someone who works hard and trains for his goal doesn't just do any old thing, he says. He follows a strict regimen. What's the Bible say about training? There's one verse that comes to my mind. It deals more with children, but it applies to all of us. Proverbs 22. With this thought, brothers and sisters, we'll, we'll, we'll conclude. And I want you to really come along with me now and think on what I'm about to share with you. Proverbs 22. Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. And let's start with verse 6. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child. Train. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. It doesn't say when he's old, he'll come back. That's not what it says. Let's not twist the Bible. When he's old, he'll still be walking in what he was trained to do. Some people don't like that word train because, what, you sound like a, a monkey. You train a monkey, you train a dog, a cat. But let's think about it. I was thinking that, you know, about, you know, since we're talking about athletes, athletes have trainers, right? An athlete can train on his own, but he's not going to get anywhere. Why? Because uh, the, all the other guys got trainers that push them. Hey, one more, one more, one more. Come on, go, go, let's go, one more. The worst thing ever that an athlete could do is when the trainer says, hey, one more, to so say, I'm trying, I'm doing it. No, you keep your mouth shut, and the trainer pushes you, and you go, 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 go. He needs someone to push him, to remind him of the goal. That's why you get a trainer. A trainer knows more than the athlete because he was an athlete in his day. And he pushes constantly. When the body gets tired, man, I can't do no more. The trainer says, come on, let's go. You got one more. That was too easy. Another one. Trainer, train. Now it's talking about train up a child in the way he should go. See, today's society says, when it comes to children especially, but this applies to everyone. Well, you experiment what you want. And then once you've tried everything, you see what doesn't work, then you can, you know, follow Christ. Then you, the boy doesn't want to go to church. Hey, you can't force, you can't force anybody to go to church. And the white writes that you cannot force and should never force a child to do anything. Even if it's good, you can't force them. But does the verse say force a child in the way he should go? Okay, so I need to understand, what does train mean? It means you get down one-on-one -on -one with, your, with your child, with the athlete, the student. You explain, you do it by example, you do it over and over, you push them, hey, come on, come on, oh, I'm tired, I don't feel like it. And I'll tell you this, and all of us, you can resonate with me because you're human. When I was young, a little young kid, I like to think I'm still young, but when I was younger, Church to me was the most boring thing in the world. There was nothing I could think of that was more boring than church. Uh, you know, and I'm saying this and the pastor's looking at me, but I, it's, it's the truth. <laughs> I'm sitting here for hours just sitting, listening to these people read a book. I was so terrible in school, I hated books, and now I'm here listening to a guy talking to from a book. It was so boring. A lot of, most everything would go in one ear and out the other. Now I'm trying to be a pastor. How does that work? God's grace. Of course, number one. First of all, God's grace. But I, I want to say that I'm going to explain myself before you freak out on me. When the, when the kid doesn't want to go to school, when the people doesn't want to go to church, nah, no, come on, Nico, vamos, let's go to church. I would go to church because I respected my dad and I would go along with him. But I would go, and it would, it, every week, every week, and it became a, uh, what's the word? A, a habit. A custom. Tradition. Ooh, that's that word. We don't want to, we want to erase that word. Tradition's not bad. 
custom, ritual, tradition, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. It's bad if two things. If it's not biblical and Christ and the love for Christ is not the center, the base. If those got those two things, you better make it a tradition. Make it a custom. Who else in the Bible had a custom of going to church on Sabbath? Jesus. Jesus says he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath as was his custom. Okay. Wait, well, Wes, aren't you always the one saying that it's not right to go to church just because you're used to going to church? Yes, that's wrong. You need to know and believe first and understand, and then you make it a custom. When you make something a custom, a, a tradition, a habit, you make a custom out of things that, what, you feel are important to you or that don't matter? Important. Important. A birthday. You celebrate the birthday every year. It comes around every year, but you celebrate it. Make a big deal. It's a tradition. It's a custom. Why? Because it's important to you to celebrate another year of life. I go to church because it's important to me. I love my Lord Jesus Christ, so I'm going to make it a custom. See, the Pharisees had traditions. They had customs. But they came from twisting of the Bible, twisting of God's law, to the point where Christ and the Bible, the law, God, this, was nowhere to be found. And they were keeping customs just to keep customs. Brothers and sisters, train up a child in the way he should go. Come to church. Come on, son. No, I don't feel like it. Do like how Jesus said. Jesus said to the disciples, you may not understand now what I'm doing, but you will later. And did they later? Oh, yes. I understand now that sitting through those boring church hours so boring, I remember all those years of making it a custom when finally I was free and I wasn't around them. I was living alone. I didn't have to go to church because I'm my own boss now. Guess what? If I didn't go to church, I felt, yeah. I felt itchy. I felt strange. I had to go yeah. because it was a custom. Okay? You are building a custom. You, the world today teaches, let the child decide first. And then he, a child who has never lived and experienced life is going to decide for himself. You step aside. You who have lived and know what's good and bad, you step aside. Let the child who has no experience decide for himself. Mm. The world teaches this. The world who has no hope, who doesn't know Christ, who because they have no hope and have no Christ, they take their own lives when times get tough. That's who teaches this. The Bible says, train up a child because the child doesn't know. You know, train up the child. When he grows old, how in the world is he going to separate from it? He's already accustomed and built and absorbed and founded in the truth. Amen. It's good to make a habit and tradition and custom from the truth. Amen? Amen. You need to make it a habit, a tradition, a custom to keep the Sabbath, to keep the commandments. If I, I realize, Lord, if I don't do that, and it's not too late, if we're not doing it, we can start. But if I don't make it a custom, to keep God's law, to put Him first. You're not going to make it when the times get tough. You're going to get swept aside with all the rest who haven't made it a custom. You see what I'm saying? Make it a custom. Train yourself. Like Paul said, I strive for the mastery. Okay, I'm a spiritual athlete. You are a spiritual soldier. I have got to exercise and train myself. The world thinks that's crazy. The world didn't make me. They didn't give me life. They're not going to do anything for me. Christ did. He did it all for me. I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to make it my custom, like Jesus did, to follow God, to follow His Word, to follow Christ. Amen. This is the complete opposite of what the world teaches. But we're in the world. We're not of the world. Amen? Amen. If this makes any sense, if you believe this, Show, show me, show the universe, and stand up to your feet. If you agree with this, if you believe, stand to your feet and sing with me the final hymn. Sing loud and clear. Don't worry, we won't judge you if you don't. God is the judge.
Let's sing this final hymn. Hymn number 633, When We All Get to Heaven. Lord God is trying to make a, a transformation in our lives so he can take us home. Thank you.